everyone, so here we are again with Chi with Anthony Monteith. I think this might be episode five. <laughs> so we're here with <laughs> Jonathan again. We're doing uh, part two because we never got to finish some of the conversation we were entering into. So Jonathan, welcome back. Um, Thank you. Is there anything you want to start, any sort of topics coming to mind in your head? Well, at the moment, things that I've been sort of working on are the our myths and how to interact with the imaginal aspect of our world. So we can maybe start there if you want to go off onto the woo-woo. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I wouldn't know where to begin with that for that one, uh, myths. I'm just trying to think of the kind of archetypes I grew up with. I always had Carl Sagan... I was mad into the UFO, the unexplained, had an obsession with uh, spontaneous human combustion. <laughs> you I know. think you were watching Spinal Tap at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn it to level 11. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what it was. I my, The kids in the street, they used to call around and that. They'd, they'd look at the books that I had on the shelf and there was no... You know, it's H.G. Wells, and and then was that was the only sort of author I was into, and then it was all unexplained UFOs, mysteries, um, and in terms of archetypes, for me, it was always those the alien invader, and it used to terrify me. You know, this idea of being taken over. But in terms of the, I mean, I know my wife is more into mythology. You know, like Greek mythology. Um, I guess, you know, uh, archetypes, wizards, you know, like dragons. Well, if you were to take the aliens, that's also an archetype in some ways in mythology. If you go back to the Sumerian texts, they talk about that the gods are actually visiting entities from another planet. Hmm. Um, okay. So the alien does fit into our mythology. And if you want to think about it from a psychological point of view, all of the gods are a mythology and an archetype and alien because they're not in our general consciousness. Mm. I mean, it would be fantastic if a god came down. Like, how would we, would we assume it's a god? We'd automatically be, what is this entity? Who is it? What is it? What does it do? Why is it here? You know, those questions would arise. Mm -hmm. Well, there's always the statement, um, if Jesus were alive today, somebody would go up to him and say, do you believe in yourself? <laughs> <laughs> we have, we have, in my house, it's Jesus, daddy. I'm like, I'm not quite there. <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, but um, Just don't hang me out. I think maybe that's, our, that's one of the problems with it. And that's one of the things that I'm working on is the deliteralization of the idea of the alien or God, that the God is going to come here and we're going to consciously be able to recognize it. Hmm. That's a very literal interpretation of what a God is. What kind of books did you surround yourself as a, as a young kid, like some from eight, nine, 10 onwards into your teenage years? So there was a lot of fantasy. Yeah. Uh, Lord of the Rings. The William Horwood Duncan Chronicles was a big uh, book for me, big series, the nine books there. Um, and then a lot of Asian philosophy, the Tao Te Ching, the Chuangzu, Lei Tzu. Um, and then a little bit after that was the Dan Millman and Carlos Castaneda period, the shamanistic learnings and approach. It's super interesting. A lot, a lot of the guys used to hang out with, uh, they're either mad into football, basketball, and that kind of thing. And then there was a few of the lads that would be in that realm, Carlos Castaneda and all that sort of stuff. And it always seemed to come in around 19 years or 18, 19, 20 into that kind of exploring realm. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of always avoided it. I mean, it was kind of, you know, your mates would say, like, read this, it's really cool. And then I'd read a few of them, I go, I don't get this. Like, you know, what's this guy on? It didn't, it wasn't, I wasn't in that place. 
uh, until I got badly injured. And then I was forced. I had nothing else I could do. I couldn't really, I could exercise a little bit, but I was forced to then go inside. It kind of woke me up, shook me up. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. I suppose a, a big part of my life was martial arts. So I didn't have much time to read. I was always training outside, you know, kicking or punching something. And I remember it, our house is a bit like the Pink Panther. And uh, my dad, you know, would come out of the toilet and I'd attack him, you know, in the stairwell. It was hilarious. And then he'd wait for me to come down the stairs and then he'd put on the balaclava and come at me pretending he was going to. And it's just like for fun. But it, it sometimes it would go badly wrong and he'd end up getting kicked down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you didn't get kicked down the stairs yeah, real yeah, quick. yeah 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 it was a bit like expect the unexpected was one of his big mottos but it was awful fun but then it was only really in the 20s before i started really reading those journey mm-hmm. books of journeying um in terms of shamanism it's an interesting concept i think it was only when i got into chinese medicine that that you know that really started to come through to me that this, where did this medicine really come from? Is it really, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, in your book, you talk about it. There's a lot of different logics and approaches and understanding, you know, reality and, um, you know, space, time, location, all these things. Um, yeah, Carlos. What, what I can't remember was that the guy that you got, went into the jungle. I remember reading. I tell you, the only, one of the only books I really read from cover to cover was Papillon. You know, Papillon. I found that book fascinating. You know, this this convict, this thug that is, was escaping from prison in uh, in South America. I haven't read Papillon. Oh, it's amazing book. It's sad. It's a sad. It's sad. Like mm-hmm. there's elements of real kind of human strife you know that it was better to be Mm -hmm. free than to be imprisoned even though trying to be free was huge suffering um it kind of rings true for me and being imprisoned isn't huge suffering yeah well the stuff i suppose where he was imprisoned was unique you know it's like okay very very few people had ever make it out of there alive at all um there was some obsession with world war ii and it still is in world war one i had I, I actually majored in english literature even though you can't tell the way i speak but i did uh, <laughs> i had <laughs> i had a choice uh as a teenager like we did something called uh, gcse's which Mm-hmm. They'd only been around in, yeah, yeah. they'd only been around about a year when we were doing them, so we were like only the second year of experimentation, but it gave us more choice and ninety percent of my class, I think I was the only one in my class, maybe maybe one or two others chose the war poems, Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, and all that, and I chose that instead of I didn't like Shakespeare, I thought it was a pompous twat. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like it. You know, I thought it was like convoluted nonsense. You know, uh, I wanted well, something more well, real, more visceral, more like, you know, spoke of of that of that suffering. And I did it, and and, and I aced it. You know, uh, mm-hmm. much to the surprise of a lot of previous um, English teachers who were pompous twats themselves. Um, well, when you look at the wartime books and literature it's mainly the hero's journey that you're looking at which would which is very much your approach to martial arts and you know it did talk to part of you being thrown into a situation where you had to become a hero Mm. Yeah, I mean, I had a past past life regression therapy done on me some time ago. I can't remember how long, maybe 15 years ago. And it it was a very interesting experience. And there was, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like dreaming, like having a dream during the session. Mm -hmm. So you're dreaming about where you were and what you were doing. You're not really there, but you're kind of in the moment. And uh, definitely there was some first 
World War stuff there for me. Um, and previous other stuff kind of, I, I've, I mean, we have horses. I love horses. I love bow and arrow archery. I have a couple of art, uh, bows and arrows here and I have a big Mongolian war bow in the clinic. So there's definitely. That's not how you do acupuncture though, is it? Uh, it's a, it's a, a socially dis- socially distanced acupuncture. <laughs> <laughs> I can get you from six feet away. Um, you might not survive, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a one but one needle the- one needle therapy. You know, <laughs> even the past life regressions. You can also look at them as a type of internal mythology that you're exploring. Hmm. Not to take them literally that these are your past lives of your soul, but they are communications of a part of you that take part in your collective unconscious and your personal unconscious. And it's not necessarily that you lived these physically, but psychologically. No, I I know what you're saying. Uh, I mean, I looked into history of my grandfather my dad's real father and he was world war one and two soldier like he survived both battles um and it's got and i don't know his history did he have brothers uncle you know it, it, there is that are you when you're splicing dna and you're taking do you take part of those memories with you was i tapping into memories of ancestral you know dna ancestral memory um well that's the epigenetics um part of it passed down trauma passed down memories Mm. are in our dna or in our you know it makes sense because none of the memories were happy you know they were always like uh, the one for example was having my left leg blown off uh you know there's a saying in black adder it's like um and he turns around and he says, who owns this map? You know, and they're looking at a map of the battlefield and he goes, well, whoever drew this map, it must belong to them. How do you know? Cause it says mine on it. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can look at it as a past experience, a past memory of a person, or you can also look at it from what would be considered an archetypal point of view, hmm. the leg especially for men, if you look in mythology, is the equivalent, especially the thigh area, yeah. is the equivalent of the womb for a woman. In Greek mythology, Zeus takes his baby and puts it in his thigh and brings it to digestion and then takes it out, and that's Dionysus. Um, Interesting. And then for that, for that part of you to be blown off, especially the left leg. It's often the left leg that is associated with that image. Yeah, that's, that's what it could was. be. Yeah, so um, it could be interpreted many ways. It could be a loss of the feminine, a loss of the connection to the womb and, the, and Gaia. You could take it as a war injury. You can take it as any part of, you know, there's thousands of ways to interpret one thing depending on which level you want to interact with it at. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because often there's, even in the I Ching, it often talks about the king, his left thigh being sliced open. Um, and that is the wound that allows him to become king. Mm-hmm. And then for the wound to go to the point where it's no longer there is, is another step, you know, that you can try to feel as to what that means for you and and what what characters are coming up in that story yeah yeah as you're talking there's all these little you know thoughts and images come in and out um yeah definitely the left thigh and the left hip has been you know one of those things i've been working with more recently um the left knee was the wounded knee. Mm-hmm. I always thought the knee is a bit of a, a as a fear based element. Water fear, okay. also mm-hmm. this fear of stepping up or stepping down. 
Is this a step down or is this a step up? You know, I, I've looked through all these different things. Uh, There's also when I first got a treatment for to, for pain for the knee, one of the guys that was treating me said, "You know, what does it mean to you? What does the left knee mean to you? What meaning does mm -hmm. it carry?" And I just, you know, logical brain was like at the time, or oh, left is female, right is male. I mean, that's yeah. what I thought. That's what I thought at the time, you know, thinking in a kind of mm. a, a non-informed way. There's an interesting thing with the knee, um, and it comes from the French language. The name for the knee in French, genou. Um, now, that means the knee. It also can mean twin, mm. which is jumel. But if you separate into two words, je means I. And nu can mean two things. It can either mean we as a group mm. or a not. Like a not, K-N-O-T. Right. So looking at it from the relationship of myself within the us of consciousness and that is where the conflict is, or that's where the, your tension is, or the knot of oneself, the knot of self, the knot of identity. And both of them can come up quite strongly within knee injuries, I've noticed. Hmm. Yeah. That, well, I mean, it was, I look back on it, it was a crisis point. I had big decisions to make, you know, for me. I mean, mm -hmm. I was only a young kid, so in my early 20s but it was do i stay in england or or do i go to ireland do i start this new business teaching martial arts or do i stay in the uk and carry on studying at the time studying as a physical therapist do i go on to i was going to go on to osteopathy school so i had all these different you know avenues mm -hmm. um yeah archetypally then for me it was that that search for them, it was like Star Wars, the search for that master, you know, for Obi-Wan, <laughs> you know, I was always looking for Obi-Wan. And it's funny now, the kids slag me with my gray beard. I've got this big white beard and they're like, daddy, you look like Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> I was like, the Obi-Wan is within you. But um, <clears throat> so I haven't mastered the ability to say these are not my children. <laughs> <laughs> i am not the father you were looking for yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah i did not uh i was not speeding in that moment uh, yeah it's not it's but not um yeah it's interesting though because the mythology of star wars is a hero's journey of the the unexpected hero luke doesn't go looking for obi-wan no um, and often that is the story of that type of mythology, right? It's, it's a Shakespearean idea. Well, Shakespeare wrote about it, um, of this mythology of the unexpected hero. You find it also in Lord of the Rings. Frodo didn't, ex didn't go, didn't want to have to do the journey, but nobody else could. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's actually very interesting. I was been watching. I've been watching a documentary series called "The Power of Myth" by Joseph Campbell. Um, and he was a master of exploring mythology. From I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's often referred to as the teacher of mythology of world mythologies within the United States. Right. And he was also worked very closely with George Lucas. And uh, George Lucas says that that was where he got the idea of, was by studying myths with Joseph Campbell. That that's was one of the keys to being able to write the Star Wars trilogy. Hmm. Yeah, the name rings a bell. It does ring a bell. I'm sure it's come. I've come across it in the past. Um, the, I'd be, I used to I used to be involved in a coaching company, and we used to do you know life coaching, business coaching, and part of my job was to help set up seminars here and get speakers over. And a lot of the speakers admitted that a lot of their hour and a half talk was, was based on the hero's journey. That's how they mm -hmm. got people in. So one guy was talking, Well, he was about, the one who wrote the book hero's journey. Yeah. So it's this idea of, 
you know, I remember one guy saying, you know, where he was and how he was failing. And then he suddenly came across this idea of selling. I think it was like, uh, it was before biohacking, right? So he's selling these headsets in the eighties and he used to sell them in the back of a magazine. And he's, he'd seen them in the States. Um, they're like a binaural beats sort of thing with flashing lights mm -hmm. and to get you into a meditative state. And he'd saw, seen them in America on sale and he thought this would be a great idea. And he brought them back to the UK and he started selling them out the back of a magazine. And it, he absolutely went from zero to hero. Like he'd been sacked no more. He didn't have a job left. It was a tough time in the UK recession was selling these things like hotcakes. You know, it's that idea of going from nothing, zero to hero, uh, being able to provide for his family uh, and, and carry on. And, you know, all, all these different heroes' journeys, like the guys who... Do you remember that case where the guy got trapped in the... Uh, in the rock in Utah, wasn't it? And he had to, he cut off his arm. I, they made the movie, was it 172 hours or something? Something like that. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. And like, he had to cut off his own arm or something to get yeah. out or his own. Yeah. And, it, and it, it shows how fundamentally as a human, we can go back to that base survival, you know, that a lot of animals will have already, you know, there are some animals that will chew off their own leg to escape from a trap, mm -hmm. you know, um, so the archetypes there around, I, I think, I don't know what was around you in the twenties, but it started to get into that. Dan, we talked about Dan Millman, you know, um, being mm -hmm. a pivotal moment that Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Have you read that book? Yes, I have. It's a yeah. beautiful book. Yeah. I, it's, it took me a long time to get to, you know, obviously I was in some different zone, and, you know, it, it, if I read it now, it would be a different, I'd have a different experience, mm -hmm. but I, I, I get when my, my body was pointing me in this direction of being free, having freedom and not being attached to anything. And, um, I, I just wasn't in that literary zone. I was in the warrior zone for many years, you know, it's just out there battling, battling, so I'd say probably from 21, 22, 23 onwards, then it was about trying to learn to let go, learning to let, to, to let mm -hmm. go. Um, uh, what books have I been reading since? I mean, I wrote, as I said to you before, I probably re read a couple <laughs> of novels. Yeah. I mean, if, I can't even remember what I've written. Born Identity, maybe I remember reading. A couple of other things, not, nothing really excited me. And then it just seemed to be more personal development stuff. I've tried some of the more, you know, Jack Canfield style tasks, uh, the 80 20 rule. I've tried all those things, you know, and, and when I was doing the coaching, they were all into that. Um, even tried to read Tony Robbins, but I got about 20 pages in and I went, no, no, this is not for me. You know, it's just not my buzz. It was too hoo ha for me. Uh, I've read some. Well, for me, it's it's too much of a literalization of an idea. It's trying to bring something that is. When you read anything about, I don't like the term self development, but in that in that genre, it should be about pointing somewhere and looking at where it's pointing, not at what it's saying. It's not looking at the finger that's pointing. It's looking at where it's pointing to. Hmm. And often we have a tendency to take something at face value and say, this is what it is. Hmm. Um, and that is the entrance by, by doing that. Either you, you buy into it and that's where fanaticism comes from. Hmm taking a theory too literally or it doesn't talk to you but if you can open up to reading something that is not a literal translation but it's opening you up it's like opening the door to go outside hmm. that's how i experience when i'm reading something is that it's not it's not a 
you know, um, recently, for example, I was reading Demian by Herman Hesse, a beautiful book. And there's a wonderful image in it of a bird coming out of an egg. And the statement is, is the bird has to destroy its world to be free. Now, I've read some um, analysis of that, and they try to go into what the egg is, what the world is. And then it becomes allegorical as opposed to metaphorical. Gotcha. Right? You can come up with many allegories of what the egg is. It's the ego, it's this, or it's that, or it's yep. society. Or... But to actually interact with that image of the bird breaking the egg to become free, and then allowing that to create something within yourself is that journey in the interaction. And often the self-help books are about giving you not the image, but they're trying to say, this is where you're going, as opposed to opening the door to allow you to find it yourself. Yeah. I mean, what comes to my mind is, what is the egg to the bird? I mean, the fact that the author well, says it's world, the bird's world, you know. It's no, the author says a world. A world. He doesn't say what it is. He says, but that's the beginning of the journey. Yeah. Now, you can interpret that in any way or you, however that opens up for you. For some people, it might be that you have to destroy your ego. You have to break your ego to be free. And others, it might be the shackles of your societal responsibility. For others, it might be your limitations of psyche. Do you not think we need a certain element of ego to get things done? We do. I wouldn't disagree with that. But what is the role of ego? Is it to... Go, is it to um, so the disillusion of ego, often it's talked about in new age, um, philosophy mm. and it shouldn't be the disillusion of ego. For me, it's a better expression to say the, um, subversion where ego becomes servient to soul. It is a vector for which soul can present, present, present itself. It is, but it should not be the controlling aspect. It should be the server aspect of the relationship. I see a that lot. Is, people, I see a lot of people in, in in here in Ireland and society in general are are seeking out plant based uh, ceremonies to help them perhaps be assisted into mm -hmm. that ego death. And I mean, it's not, that might be shocking to some people listening to this, you know, but it's, uh, it's not new. Like th the cultural aspects of doing this have been around for centuries. Right. So millennium, millennium. And we talk about the shaman who would have taken, you know, s uh, probably more regularly than the people using the medicine, taking it to help tune into the person taking the medicine um, um and you know i i was always fascinated <laughs> it's funny i don't know why this has come up in my head but i remember this scene in a film called young guns which was a terrible trashy 1980s oh it's fun <laughs> where they all end up take, they all end up hallucinating on some sort of cactus <laughs> and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like he has to go off and, and find the solution of what they're to do next like how are they going to overcome being lost or whatever it is that they're at but you know i thought wow what an interesting thing to put in the middle of a a hollywood blockbuster like and then it was obviously how important that is to that culture and apparently so what i've what i've researched is that there are huge movements now in, in the native american uh autonomous regions where they're pushing to have to protect these uh species of um of different mm -hmm. cacti because they're they're being basically 
uh, picked too early and they're too small and it's ruining the eco structure and it's ruining, you know, the sacred aspect of this medicine. And mm -hmm. I do think there is a history of what I call psychedelic tourism. Of um, course. And that was, that started and the person who is <laughs> the natives who they blame for that is actually Carlos Castaneda. Interesting. Because he talked about the peyote journeys in his first book. Hmm. Um, and there's been lots of other uh, comments on Carlos Castaneda, whether it was plagiarized or not, a whole bunch of other things. Right. Um, but one thing that I would return to is you talked about this idea of ego death. And what is often not remembered or not taken into account in there is the whenever we say ego death or anything that dies, there's a rebirth with it. So it's the, it's the death of the ego as you know it for the ego to be reborn hmm. in this subservient place to your soul. Yeah, It is not the absolution and the ego does not exist anymore. It is that process of allowing what you hold on to the, to die for then something new to come into it, into place. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I, that's I, often I, not talked about. It's only talked about just destruction of the ego, but not the rebirth of the ego in a new form for a new journey. But can we not go through ego death without psychedelic enhancement? I mean, of I'm course sure. you can. We, we, I mean, that's what the Buddhas, the Buddhas have been practicing that. Yeah. The Buddhists, the Taoists, um, when you go into some of the Bush um, Aboriginal communities in, in Australia, they will go into trance without any type of medicine or um, that was the alchem alchemical um, tradition in Europe. Yeah. I mean, I, the, you know. the hermetics. Yeah. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, to be honest with you, I've had so many strange, I mean, even for me with my strange head, strange experiences that I've, I've, I've said to I mean, I've been offered 12 times now. I've been reached out to by various people, lovely people. Some people I don't really know. and wouldn't really know whether I could, there's a trust issue there, but um, I've been offered like 12 times to go and do, sacred plant medicine ceremonies, predominantly ayahuasca. And um, mm -hmm. there are obviously legal issues around that, which, you know, is the way it is. I don't think it's a huge threat to society in any way. Um, it's definitely not, from what I can tell, an easy thing to do. So I don't think everybody, every man and woman on the street is going to be doing it. Um, but I you know, having t having 12 invitations over a period of 12 or so years, nearly one every year uh, from different people. Um, and it's almost like because they've had such an amazing journey with it and had such amazing insight, therefore I will have the same. But uh, the experiences I've had in training in, in Qigong, Neigong, um, and, and just from my own uh, personal awareness, I've, I've actually done a lot of searching over should I need to do it and it's always come back you don't you don't need to do it it's not it has to be it's, for you you know personally one of the things that we forget is that the psychedelic medicine in its shamanic form often it would only be the shaman who would take it in a tribe and they would go to the other world and then heal the person from the other world. Um, we as Westerners and part of the ascension movement that started with the Buddha and Jesus, etc., we believe in this idea of personal salvation as opposed to as opposed to something greater. Mm. So we've interpreted that we have to have the experience on the other side. But that's true. That's not in the tradition of the 
of the plant itself within its traditional uses. It's part of our own ego is that I need to be the I need to be the enlightened one. Right? Yeah. Even Buddhism is about personal enlightenment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do remember reading, uh, I think when the Dalai Lama was very young before, mm -hmm. you know, and he was, they said to him, you know, what's the path for human beings? And he said for us to, you know, obviously towards enlightenment. And I said, well, when, when do you know when the human is truly enlightened? And he said something like, well, we'll only know that when every single human on the planet is all enlightened at the same time, which, you know, seems to be nigh on impossible in this current circumstances. I mean, what is enlightenment? Enli to enlighten, mm. to become a lighter, to become more light-like. Um, I, think, I think we can all have moments of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. in our in our in our journey um like that one of the podcasts there with my friend thanos he was saying you know uh he's returned back to greece to be amongst his tribes and, and he he's like i'm going through layers of unfolding of enlightenment so it doesn't just come in one huge packet no. for him it comes in these little you know, I can imagine if you got enlightened in one massive go, you'd be probably considered a lunatic, crazy, you know? Yeah. Well, there's two things to that that I would respond is, first of all, in the Chinese Taoist approach, they don't talk about enlightenment. They talk about a realized person. Yeah. So it's not about this idea of light. It's about seeing you and seeing the world for what it really is which is much different than our term enlightenment. Because the realized person also includes the darkness that is part of the world. Whereas enlightenment is all about, as we say, light, which is only one part. Um, what, what we're doing is we're creating a dichotomy, a polarization of light and darkness, and we're saying we're going to go towards the light. But that doesn't include the darkness. As we know in the almost all religions, we talk about this, this dualistic state, and the idea is to be somewhere in the middle, which also includes the darkness and the light. So that would be the first thing I would say. And the second is, is in the Zen Buddhist approach, they talk about satori, which are moments of realization. It comes in a flash and it can leave in a flash. It can leave an impact on you. Um, and there's this idea of, well, now I'm going to be talking a little bit about my personal vision of it, is that a lot of people are talking about, I want to become a multidimensional being and I want to go up into the stars and the universe and be one with everything. That's only a part of the journey. Once you've done that, it's about coming back and living your life here and experiencing the world with that experience of being one with everything. Yeah, that's integrative. And it's where, well, my personal thing is, is that a lot of the spiritual movements are all about how to be one with the universe. And there's, they're missing or they're, they're not going far enough in how to be one with the world and the universe at the same time. Well, right? like We've that. talked many times about fractals, and that is yeah. what the fractal is, is that it's the big and the small interacting on a constant basis. 
Well, we had a conversation when we, we were training this morning to listeners. We were doing some Nagong and Qigong combined this morning. And we had a conversation about the sim- doing simple things and getting pleasure and enjoy. And you talked mm-hmm. about brushing your teeth and it being the, you know, after that experience of your bone breathing Nagong, having that idea of even brushing the teeth was pleasurable. And I think when you read, uh, I can, can never pronounce his name. I think, he, is he still alive? Uh, he's a Vietnamese uh, monk. Uh, Tan Chat. I know who you're talking about. The person who created the Plum Village School of Vietnamese and Buddhism. Yeah, and he talks about, you know, even just washing washing up and like sweeping the floor mm-hmm. as being just incredibly Zen, you know, incredibly connected and pleasurable because it's not actually about the act of doing it. It's the connection, it's the connection to everything in that moment. Uh, and I th- I'm sure we've all, well, most of us have had some kind of, whether it's surfing or jumping out of an airplane or having sex, you've had that idea of connection or that brief mm-hmm. moment of Sartori or whatever you want to call it. For me, my training and my, uh, just my current buzz, and it's been my current buzz, and I say current buzz, it's been my current buzz for about 25 years, is being able to be enlightened on the side of a street corner waiting for the tube yeah. or on the bus or you know, driving your car around some country village here in Ireland and still being in a state of awareness, enlightenment. And, um, and being able to connect to the beauty of life itself. You know, you could be walking down the street and you, um, when I walk from my house to the metro stop, I walk in front of these plants that are very strong lavender. And when I walk by, I f- there's times where this smell of lavender just almost overtakes you. And you just, you're able to appreciate the beauty of something that is always there. Um, and when you were talking about the brushing of the teeth earlier, it was not that I was brushing my teeth because it was good for my teeth or because I enjoyed the sensations, because that was the action that I was doing. And that action was in, I was doing that action fully with all of my being whatever that action is, right? Yeah. So for me, that's, and, that's why I do Qigong is to, to get to mm-hmm. that state. It's, it's, it's the assistance of that state. And I usually find... Oh, the Pink Panther. That's funny. <laughs> Watch out. My dad, <laughs> my dad could attack you at any minute. Um, it's it's uh, the idea of... Um, you know, having that moment when you're brushing your teeth in Qigong, not looking for that moment, but if that moment arises, know that it's a side effect almost of the training rather than something to go chasing, if that makes sense. I wouldn't say the word side effect because that's, but I would say it is an opening that the training, but it's it's an opening that the training is happening, but it's not a goal in itself. Yeah. It's a present from the training itself. It's a, it's a gift that you take, say thank you, yeah. and you continue. Well, my teacher would say there's a wind, there are these windows, and you sometimes like. How can I describe? Sometimes it's like you know you get a you might have a girlfriend that's totally obsessed with you and can't stop texting you, and is totally all over you, and like you, you you it might be nice in the beginning, and then after a while it gets annoying because they keep chasing you, chasing you, chasing you, and you you feel uh, consumed by this person's obsession or this uh, infatuation, which can eventually become unattractive for some people. So (laughs) he would say like the the windows open, you're being shown something and take that information on board, but don't, don't attach too much uh, emphasis to it because if it's for you, it will keep, keep showing itself. You know, it'll keep appearing, um, and it's that spontaneity that, as you say, that gift. It's a gift. I, I I'm using the word side effect because it's just, you know, I like that's mm-hmm. just me. I like to to say that. I think it's a play on on. We have a negative a connotation to side effects, but I try to put a positive spin yeah. on it. Um, 
Yeah, but you're right. So there's gifts. There's little gifts. I agree with you on that. Um, I, I I tell this story. I think it's on it's on the book that I was writing of. Um, I'm actually just thinking of it now. Looking at my fireplace, we've got this big piece of wood that we're thinking of of putting above and the mantelpiece. And um, we did this meditation in an old building, brick and wood building. It was, I think, a woolen mill or something like that in London. And the idea was to pick a spot on the wall, open eye meditation and focus in on that one spot without Mm -hmm. closing your eyes. So you couldn't blink. So it's, it's actually quite difficult if you try it. And then you bring in the breath and the connection, different parts of the body, energetic centers. Yeah. And um, pretty much halfway through the meditation, about 40 minutes into it, the piece of wood starts talking to me. And I don't mean like a mouth, nose, eyes. It's just like this. Uh, the images are coming. You're, you're receiving the images of the soul of the wood. Yeah. So it starts to show me where it used to live its position, how it was cut down. Mm -hmm. Parts of it went into a battleship. Another part went into a building of a church and then into this building of um, this mill or whatever. I'm not going to say mill. It's can't really describe it, but very old Oak. And I'm like literally going, in my head in this training thinking I'm absolutely tripping out here on this training. I'm, you know, having a psychedelic conversation with a piece of wood. Um, and at the end we did a round Robin. There was about 20 of us in the training and the instructor was going around and I was too scared at the time. I was like, what do I say? Like to explain to him, I've had a conversation with a piece of wood, you know? <laughs> so, but he, he, I kind of just kept my mouth shut, didn't say anything. I was, you know, just made up some bullshit about struggling to concentrate. And then he talked about the first time he did it properly. He was in a church hall and he was lying on his back doing it. And the the beams in the church hall started talking to him and telling him. And this guy didn't know what I'd been through, but he was sharing an experience that was similar. And then I was like, oh, okay. I knew then I'm, I'm doing, this is the right training for me. I'm doing, you mm-hmm. know, if somebody else is experiencing, I'm not mad. This is a shared experience, you know? And I just started laughing as he was telling the story. I just burst into laugh, rolled over on my side, laughing, laughing. And he's like, what are you laughing at? And I was like, I've just had the same experience, you know, um, <laughs> confirmation. I'm not entirely mad, but it was just amazing. And, and I tried to interpret it years later and you kind of go into the quantum sphere. Was it quantum information? Was it the soul of the wood? Was it the the energetic imprint of the actions of the humans? Well, one of the exercises that I've been working on recently is that whether it is an object, an atomate, or a tree, anything, is... Instead of trying to name it in our modern language, you say a piece of wood, a beam, but to ask the question, who art thou? And I use the word thou very importantly here because thou means it has a character, it has a personality. To connect to the personality of whatever you're interacting with. And that's the opening to this conversation that you had with this piece of wood. You know, there's the, um, we talk about soul as being, I have my soul, you have your soul. And then there's this idea is that the soul embodies the universe. And you're connecting to that part of yourself that is connected to soul and to the rest of the universe. And what it sounds like to me is, is when you had that experience is that you were in that language in that world of soul. And so you could see the soul of what you were interacting with. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I have this, I don't know, it's not unique to human beings, I don't think, but I have this amazing ability to speak to the dead a lot. And often, Mm -hmm. I had a very strange, I had a very interesting experience 
So, you, you know, when you say the soul, it could be the soul of anything, not just a human, right? It's just something mm-hmm. you can do. I don't know how. Um, and it's not important how. No. We, we, were, we, were, we just come back from a holiday in the west of Ireland. Fantastic. The weather here has just been... I know you're it's pissing rain in, in Switzerland and Germany and places. We're having this completely unusual... We're having almost Central European weather and you're having Irish weather. It's... Um, but it's an extreme version. But we were out in the West and we went to visit uh, a village. And in the village uh, is a lady that works there who was uh, previously uh, a child minder of my wife when she was small. So she would have looked after my my wife as, as a kid. And uh, she has a lovely vintage clothing. Uh, Olive and Crew, we'll give her a plug. Olive and Crew, it's a beautiful vintage clothing <laughs> Uh, shop in the, in in, um, in La Hinch, and uh, we're in this shop anyway, and they're having a conversation. The lady's very busy who owns the shop, and it's great, and she's thriving, and and they're beautiful clothing, amazing clothing, and um, and uh, this lady standing behind her, and I know that that when I see it, it's, I know that person's not not on this earthly current reality but it's super interesting because i've seen this lady before so it's not like a a brand new uh Mm -hmm. interaction and i saw this lady before when my wife was pregnant with my daughter and then you know so i'm getting this information that this lady you know is was very close to my wife and this lady turned out to be a prominent figure in 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 my wife's childhood um, and it's very interesting that the shop is named after this lady, Olive. Um, and then, uh, and yet the lady, the lady that appeared to me didn't have such a great relationship with her daughter. There was a lot of mother daughter infighting, but, um, now her relationship is support, one of support for her daughter. Um, so I'm seeing the soul, the real soul of the relationship. And I often, from what I've seen and, and, and people that I've interacted with both here and not here is that a lot of this is just lessons. A lot, a lot of us being here are lessons and we're all playing a role. So you're playing a role with me. I'm playing a role with you, even though we're not consciously aware of that role. And when we go to wherever it is that we go to alternate reality, uh, we unplug ourselves from this video game into the next one it's um you can find actually that the bigger soul the oversoul the the bigger controlling mechanism of the avatar is is is, um is more complete is more um i don't know i can't even use the word awareness but it's it's Mm -hmm. It's almost like Jonathan, you've been brought here to play the role of teacher. <laughs> but really, in the other reality, you're more than just that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But we need you to challenge. I do. It, it's like you're coming in to learn a specific skill or relearn it or to come mm-hmm. away with something so that when you go back to source energy or I'm not even going to say heaven because talking to dead people, it's not heaven. There's no such thing doesn't exist. Now that's just my interpretation of the data. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's so if don't any religious nuts out there are going to kill me, don't kill me. You know, heaven is a human word. Um, Is there a hell? Uh, I've not talked to, I've only talked to maybe one or two really nasty, what I could say nasty, uh, you know, human interpretation of nasty, nasty spirits, but there is a levels of vibration mm-hmm. according to what you resonate with. So an example would be hit, Hitler is held in a certain vibrational state. Buddha is held in another one. And you stay in that mm-hmm. vibration until you're ready to progress. That is the traditional or one of the traditional views of it. Um, one thing that came to mind there, 
was a wonderful Alan Watts quote talking about the infinity of the universe. Mm. And he tells the story of, imagine that every night you could go to sleep and choose what you dream. And you live for eternity. So maybe the first night you would dream about only the things that would make you happy, whether it's lots of money, having a beautiful, loving relationship, or having lots of women or lots of men, or you would indulge yourself. And after a while, that would become boring. And you would start to create more and more stories in your dreams to amuse you. And eventually, you would come to the world exactly as we have now. That would eventually be one of the dreams of eternity. And then that dream will stop at one time and another dream will come on. I don't know why that came up in my mind, but that was similar to this idea of heaven and hell are still these finite places that we perceive as happening after death. Hmm. Um, another story that comes to mind is there was a, I think this is a Zen Buddhist story. There was a samurai who used to cut, uh, he used to kill people. He was a, an assassin samurai. And if anybody talked bad to him or insulted him, he would just kill them. He would cut them in half. And in the culture, samurais were allowed to do that. And one time he was trying to think about his soul and he went to see a Buddhist monk and he said, monk, tell me what is heaven, what is hell? And the monk says, you, you're stupid, I won't tell you. And the man got really mad and was about to kill him. And the monk says, that's the door to hell. Hmm. Yeah, that's fair. And then he started... That's very and then he started to cry and he didn't kill him. Mm -hmm. And he started to say, oh my God. And then the monk said, that's the door to heaven. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very good. That's a, that's a brilliant, brilliant uh, insight. And, and it's that idea of the human construct. Um, I remember one having an interaction with one spirit and it said, you know, uh, we were taught because I was asking quite, you know, quite my obsession with World War II. I was asking deep and meaningful questions around World War II and why, why, what was Hitler doing? What was he thinking? And uh, it, show, it showed me a picture of Hitler before he came to the earth. And the spirit was saying, you know, Hitler was a little boy, a little frightened boy. And he was placed into this environment and he was molded by his environment around him and the people around him. And he was created by others. And it was a design to show people to, I mean, I mean, I'm using him as an example there are mm -hmm. probably others that are, were even far more worse than, than he was. Maybe some that have never been recorded in history, but, um, you know, it's, it's then, you know, this idea of coming here as, as a human incarnation and then this, I suppose within the billions of people there are this, this, you could seemingly randomly chaotic, events in his life then help mold into this this kind of uh, creation and then this idea well actually was he a representation of the collective consciousness at that time in that the collective time. unconsciousness you want to say yeah sorry uh and it just it, i had this and this conversation went on for ages and it was just like wow you know i, I, I it just words fail me, you know, words fail me. Um, in the lessons, lessons that we still are, haven't learned or, or are still learning. 
Uh, and I know we can talk about Stalin and Mao and, you know, and Pol Pot and the events in Rwanda and then the current, if you want to get very deep, the current genocide and, and human trafficking is, it's like, it's not just this one event. It's consistently always going on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, my children are, are amazing. They, they, they love diversity. We were down at this lakeside the other day and two beautiful children, I'm going to say of African origin descent. I'm going to say that. I'm not saying it's certain, but definitely from my experience of African origin. Um, yeah, just amazing interaction with my ch child and this child and playfulness and willingness to be open and, and the African child had no fear of coming over and sitting down and didn't interact with any of the other kids, but had no problem coming down and sitting with us, you know, and I'm always totally at comfort and at ease. I don't, even though culturally very different and, and definitely second generation or third generation, second generation, I'm going to say, because they were quite strong accents. So I'm saying second generation African origin. And, um, and I thought, you know, this whole BLM thing that's been going on, it's not even about that. It's just being comfortable with one, just the one, the oneness uh, that, you know, color, race, creed, it's all epigenetic. It's all a, 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 a response to the environment. I don't even know what I'm saying here, but it's... <laughs> I've kind of gone off on one there. But, uh, yeah, maybe you can pull me back out of that hole I'm digging for myself, but it's... Uh... <laughs> no, I'm actually happy. I'm trying to see how far you go before I say anything. Yeah, yeah. This is fun. I'm not even sure what I'm trying to say, but it's it, it shouldn't be a big thing at all but it's with the current emphasis of what's going on it's become a big thing you know well it's always been a big thing this idea of separation yeah that's what i'm trying to say I and i think a lot of it has to do with the miss or the when our i when we are not secure in the more identity is placed on the exterior world, the more we look for our separation from the exterior world and what can separate us. So the more that we have a need to say, I am different than those people or anything else, because I do not connect to something deep in myself that I can, I, that I can feel connected to. So one of the ways of feeling connected to yourself is by saying, I'm not that person. And the more obvious the difference between the, the physical difference, the easier it is to say that person is not like me. Hmm. And so that's why a lot of texts and a lot of spiritual work it's about first learning to accept yourself and heal yourself to heal the world because once you are in line with yourself the world seems to come in line with you because you're not creating separation you're not saying i'm different than that yeah I had an amazing conversation with my son about this. We, um, I, I don't know if you know, I kind of amateurly amateur into human design work, even though mm -hmm. I don't entirely agree with this guy's work, all of it. It's a little bit, uh, there's some, can be some negative connotations to it, but there's more modern interpretation of the work. Uh, Ra Uru was his, was ch his name that he chose. Um, but uh, the Gene Keys is the more modern version now that's been Richard Rudd. It's interesting work. But uh, 
I spoke to my son and said, like, you know, we'll do do a chart and see see where you're placed on that chart. And he come up as pure manifesto. And he said, he actually said to me this weekend, that kind of makes sense. I said, what, in what way, Sunshine? He says, because when I want something to happen, it will happen almost instantly if I don't, like in his own words, uh, don't force it. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, so it could be something really silly like he wants ice cream, right? But he says to me, if, I, if I'm wanting ice cream, really want it, it won't happen. He said, in my mind, if I have an image of ice cream, just like the pleasurable image of a big cone, 99, soft ice cream, chocolate flake in it, he said, within minutes, it'll be like, boom, should we go get an ice cream, Scott? You know, and it's, and it, and it's, he's realizing this now. And, 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 and I'm not saying it's the fact that he's realized this without attaching any meaning, like he's not. He doesn't understand what manifesto means. He doesn't understand human design, but he's now getting a grasp on how he, how he works within how his how his alignment. And it can be something as simple as ice cream. It doesn't have to be some big spiritual mission, although some people would say ice cream is extremely spiritual. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's that idea, as you say, that alignment with your your hopes, your dreams, your wishes, and it res then resonates, and then. I think this is where they were alluding to in the secret, but it just got turned into some absolute BS. But this is the problem with what Scott is doing is if we were to take it from a Taoist point of view, he's in alignment with the Tao. Hmm. He's, he's what, what is the, is he manifesting it or is the ice cream manifesting itself in him? The idea of the secret was to turn that on its head and to say your ego decides what it wants and then it will come. Mm. And maybe a more holistic approach is what wants to manifest will manifest in yourself, not you will manifest it. Mm. And there it's a question of being open to something as opposed to manifesting itself that it comes from Scott and the ice cream comes the ice cream is there and it calls to Scott. Yeah. And for me, that is a more open and true. It it talks more to me. I've seen many people go down the line of, the secret or what's the bleep or any of these types of um, it's cult. If you manifest it, it will come. It has created social problems for them, not at the moment, but in the long term, because they're not in, they're not following the Tao. They're not following the way they're trying to form the way. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, I, I mean, it's, I would have a slightly different take on it, but I, I, I get the essence of what you're saying. Absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, we all have that one buddy who's, I mean, I even say it with my clients, you know, clients, sometimes come clients who are in a lot of pain, who can't, who are looking for a quick fix, realize there's no quick fixes. So they completely distract themselves with a load of spiritual stuff and they consume reams and reams of spiritual angels and all this Mm -hmm. kind of stuff whatever i have nothing against it but it's complete distraction from the journey in my in my in my limited perception of what i see from them but it's um yeah you all we all have that one buddy who's like i'm super connected to the to the universe and i got (laughs) this going and that going and like my angel card told me and it's like okay yeah yeah but it's all about, it's all consuming. Um, I have a relative where it all consumed her. She became totally obsessed with her gifts and powers in it. I think, unfortunately, it distracted from life. So she stopped engaging in life, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, There's a beautiful term for that, that Jeff Brown often uses. It's called spiritual bypass. Thank you. That sounds, that's exactly, exactly what it is. 
It's like a triple bypass of the spiritual nature. <laughs> you know, you're avoiding all the soul work, all the experience, and you're trying just to go to this spiritual place, thinking that's going to solve everything. Yeah. And, and I see it when there's a point of crisis in their life. So maybe they, I don't know, they lose their job or they get kicked out of their apartments mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And then it's, you know, and, and maybe it's a good crutch for them and they go, oh, you know, the universe will provide. No, it's going to, you know, it's the path. And, and I get it. I totally get it. But really what it is is they've been kicked on their ass and they've got to actually go out there and find somewhere to live. It's not angels or spirits or guides. It's like literally going out there and doing the work to find the next apartment or next job. Um, it reminds me of the young, I don't know if this is a true story or, but it was said that when a friend would come to tell Young, I just got a promotion, he would look at him and say, I'm very sorry for you. We'll get through this together. <laughs> when another friend would come and say, I just lost my job, Young would take out a bottle of champagne and say, let's celebrate. Now stuff's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's that the divine moment is in in that crisis point, isn't it? I mean, the idea that exactly we we, we grow out of crisis. I mean, I, what do you think about this recent events with these guys going up into the nanosphere? It's not really space. I mean, technically, I mean, I mean, we we. we <laughs> I, Whether I, it's space or not, it's not the issue. No, I know, but you know what I mean. It's like. Uh, is this the ultimate expression of, of, of leaving, leaving the current reality and experiencing not a, a different version of reality just to show what's possible, what human, humans can do, or is it just big swinging dick competition? I would say... With the Blue Origin obviously looking more like a dick than the... <laughs> <laughs> um. I think my response to that would be it's more a literalization of materialism and exploration. It's this idea of I need to find a physical frontier to go through mm. as opposed to doing that as a personal journey inside. They are externalizing this need, which we all have, for exploration. But as opposed to allowing it to come inside and to explore oneself, they literalize it into the physical world. There was a statement from the Buddha who said, he who travels the greatest is the one who travels inside. Something along those lines. And this need to go outside, this exploration, think about all the explorers. Going back to colonialism, it was all about getting more stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a material journey. They want something they can hold on to. Yeah. And space yeah. is that continuation. So uh, are we still going through that right now with everything that's happening? Is this a cash grab on the back of a pandemic? Are we... Are we still seeing people opportunistic? I'm not whether judging it right or wrong, but is it just part of that nature to say, you know, here's an opportunity to change how we do things and we're going to jump on that? Or is it is it that word again, side effect to a knee-jerk reaction? Um, or do you think it's a genuine, it was going to happen anyway and this was the catalyst? for that change let's say all three of them all of those are probably correct in some way in some way okay you know i'm not a psychologist i have not sat down with them i have not looked into their psyche um probably they have a bad they can answer that better from their own perceptions hmm. all we can do is see what is this what is this world telling us? What is the story that is being played out in front of us? And what is our role in this story? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I have some friends who are very 
shall we say, either spiritually bypassed <laughs> or, <laughs> they would say, you know, this is the re- great, and I hate that, the great reset. It's not really a reset. It's, it's a transition. But every moment is a transition and a reset. Yeah. Any particular moment in your life is like that. Exactly, but I think that's the first kind of global realization of that transition. So would you not say World War I would have been that? World War II? Uh, I think perhaps, but... The Cold War, perhaps, which happened over 40 years? Yeah, but I th- and I think probably more so the Cold War because, you know, we had that constant... We were living in that constant fear of someone pushing the button, you know? Um, I think, you know, the Great War and all that, it was it was still media driven, you know, the newspapers. Uh I suppose Second World War was all radio based, you know. Uh you you would then go to the cinema and you'd have the updates before you so you sit there in the cinema watching your film, Roy Wright, whatever it was. The films were out then in the forties. And then, you know, but before that you'd have half an hour film reel, which was probably heavily edited and focused more mm-hmm. in on, you know. Uh, how your side was doing well and the other side was yeah Yeah. and i think that's still kind of being played out maybe more so and it it just feels probably more because we have 24 7 news coverage in many different platforms we have 24 7 news coverage we have social media we have this perception of absolute connection to the world but we have real separation from it at the same time. Yeah. Well, I think it creates separation. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, 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 can, I can sense when I'm around people at the moment, there's this huge dichotomy of uh, put a mask on, don't wear a mask on. I forgot to put the mask on. Oh, now I'm going through the corridor without a mask on, but it says put the mask on. And then you've other people who are just sat around going, fuck the mask. I'm not wearing a mask. Fuck this. It's a year and a half now. I don't want to wear a mask. Why should I wear a fucking mask? I'm double jabbed. Fuck this. And it's like, you know, it's very odd. It's this, this total chaos, confusion. And I think it's a really good place to be because from that then comes clarity. From it will come clarity. Um, um, a friend posted. I don't know if it's clarity that comes from it, but well, it reminds me of their own clarity where they feel they belong rather than. Mm-hmm the global belonging. Um, well, what I was going to say is it reminds me of the Zen Buddhist approach of the riddle, where they ask a riddle that can't have an answer. And the idea is not to find the answer, but to feel the confusion and the chaos and to feel comfortable in it. You know, the, the old saying, uh, if a tree falls in the wood, does it make us, and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Mm. It seems like we are put in that situation now as each of us. And that is the journey that we're going on. So when, when that's why I would say it wouldn't bring clarity, but it brings an openness to all aspects of the question. Mm. Yeah. You know, instead of it being, if a tree falls in the world, in the wood, no one's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Is mm. If I wear a mask, does somebody else get, <laughs> do I promote, do I continue the pandemic? If I don't wear a mask, am I resisting the pandemic? Yeah. All of those questions have some truth in them and it's to open up to the truth along all the lines you know we had we there's been these protests uh going on globally um mm-hmm. and peaceful you know not actually more peaceful than than expected i think in some ways and um you know, the, the numbers reported, uh, you know, far lower uh, than, than, and this is like where, 
social media is becomes a powerful tool as for truth as well as for lies. There's that balance. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have this philosophy that if we're forced to wear masks, it will allow us to unmask ourselves. <laughs> that was going to bring me to another point I was going to say after. Okay. So, you know, that's, I mean, I, I have clients who love wearing the mask. They love it. They don't want it to go away. They're, they're in that. It's a comfort zone with it. It makes them feel safe mm -hmm. and protected, and they don't need to show their face in public. Yeah. It's a complete counterpunch to facial recognition technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was also, yeah. Yesterday, I was told you I was watching the series about uh, the power of myth, and they show, I can't remember, it's somewhere in South, Southeast Asia, in a cavern, a statue. And the statue has one face in the front and two faces looking out to the side. Yeah, another one. And the face in the front has a mask. And it is the mask from which from which you can see eternity. Because if you were to look at eternity completely, your eyes, you as a person would not be able to fathom the image. So you have a mask of eternity. And then you have the future and the past or the dualistic state on both sides of the head. And it's to not look at the dualistic sides, but to look at the front. But the reason I was thinking about it is this mask. And we can only see things through a mask. We can never see what is behind the mask. And I think there's something about the current situation, which is allowing us to see that, yes, we're wearing a mask, a physical mask now, but we also all carry masks, as you were saying. Yep. And I think that's a lot of the resistance to the mask is that people have attached themselves to their personal mask of their face, thinking that that's them. But when you detach from your personal mask of your face, however many masks you need to put in front of yourself doesn't matter anymore. I'm always fascinated with how amazingly beautiful people's eyes are, you know, that it's 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 yes. helped me connect more, make better eye contact, and an occasion when I've had to do tongue diagnosis, and they take the mask off, and you look at the face, and the face doesn't match their eyes. <laughs> it's <just> amazing. <laughs> I've like, had the same experience. Yeah, and it's yes. like, whoa! You don't look anything like I imagined you to look like. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. So. We're coming up to an hour and a half on this podcast. I think it's time for me to go and make pancakes for my kids, as is the Sunday tradition. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Jonathan, Excellent. for your, your spiritual insights and delving and navigating the psyche. Uh, I know that's a huge uh, point of your work is dealing with trauma and dealing with archetypes and delving into that. So if you want to meet up with Jonathan, he is in Lausanne. He has um, his mm -hmm. own acupuncture practice there. Also just authored a book, um, which I have here. It's currently just been published. Um, it's Sun Seasons yes. and Channels. Great for lay people as well as for academics. Um it's an uh, introduction into Chinese uh, philosophy and specifically uh, it's a story, actually. What I like about it, it's not a technical manual. Okay, so talking about that hero's journey, well, this is more an inquisitive, childlike journey into learning. Um, so I'll leave the links there. That book, I think, is, uh, is available on Singing Dragon. It's probably the best platform to get it on but it is available on if you're in the uk singing dragon if apparently europe is very difficult for 
Oh, Ireland is okay, but if you're outside of Ireland, um, you can get it from any online retailer. Um, normally it's has on, it. Is it on Amazon as well for those who want to support going up? It's on stores? Amazon. It's also available as an ebook. Ebook, right? Um, and the ebook is nice because you have, if you have a color reader, you can also get the images in color on the ebook. Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, so thanks, Jonathan, for that. It's been uh, a good. A good chat, a very good chat, and um, it was. What's the weather like there at the moment? Is it still raining, or are you coming into the light? It's going between thunderstorms, moments of cloud, moments of sun, and then going back to thunderstorms. That sounds like the Irish weather. <laughs> I'm joking. So it feels like so it feels like Ireland should be. <laughs> <laughs> just before. <laughs> Before just before we go, what music have you been listening to recently? What have you been listening to? Um, a Canadian folk singer named Ben Kaplan. Okay, interesting. I don't know that. One. Um, very interesting musician songs. Yep, you you can look him up. He has uh, some really interesting lyrics and also musicality. Okay check that one out so on the cup of tea that's the end of the podcast and um, please tune in uh we now have it up on buzzsprout which is the podcasting platform where it's available on spotify and i will be uploading this video onto youtube for those of you who like to look at people's faces unmasked <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much jonathan have a great uh, weekend. thank you very much anthony cheers you too